The single most important reason that this country won the Battle of Britain was because it was the first one in the world to have developed an integrated air defence system. Why did it exist in this country and not another one? Well, this country had the honour to be the first ever to have been attacked from the air. The first bomb fell on Britain actually as early as 1915 during the First World War. And despite manful efforts at doing so, it proved to be almost impossible to defend the country by air. Uh, the Germans lost more bombers through accidents than through any actions taken on the part of the air defences. Uh, the gunfire that, that was unleashed from London on the German bombers was actually stopped in 1917 because falling shrapnel was causing more injuries to civilians in London than it was to German airmen. Nevertheless, the lessons learned during the First World War were vital in laying the foundations for what became known as the Dowding system, which won the Battle of Britain. And those foundations were laid by a man called General E.B. Ashmore. Ashmore was a general. Uh, he was a member of the Royal Flying Corps, and that was part of the army. And in 1929, after he retired, he wrote a book called Air Defence, and he laid out all the necessary infrastructure to make the air defences of this country effective. He had the gridded map system, he had gun lines, he had the observer corps. But he emphasised one thing above all else, which is that the aircraft, although it was the first line of defence, would be quite ineffective without a system of control from the ground. Ashmore then can be thought of as the architect of the system. The person who built it was a rather peculiar man, Hugh Dowding known as Stuffy Dowding. He can be thought of as the builder. He is the person who put all the many elements together to create this integrated system. He was involved in the specification of the aircraft, aircraft that had to be low-wing monoplanes so that they could fly fast enough and high enough to intercept bombers, and they were armed with eight machine guns so that they could actually shoot them down. He is the person who commissioned the developments in radar. He is the person who put together the communication system and constructed a, a way of not only processing information but passing it on to other elements with a very clear idea as to what each of those elements could actually do with the information. He is the person who made sure that we could identify which raids were hostile uh, we therefore had an IFF, Identification Friend and Foe system, that we could track our own pilots from the sets of stations that used to actually uh, guide them in to intercept raids. He put the whole lot together. He was a peculiar man, um, Frederick Pyle, uh, the person who probably knew him best, who was the head of AA command and himself a general, said that he was the most outstanding airman he met during the war. However, he said, Dowling was an odd fish. He was a difficult man, a stubborn man, a rather remote man who tended to find his own corner and was very intolerant of people at the air ministry who questioned him. But that's probably what it took to actually achieve this. Dowding, I think, is remarkable in combining in one person something that you normally only find in two separate people. One thing was the ability to conceptualise, to be visionary, to be able to think forward and imagine things that do not currently exist. And the other is huge attention to detail, pragmatism and making things work. Those two characteristics came together in the head of that one person who more than any other is the one who created the means for winning the battle. And the Dowding system has become known is I think one of the great intellectual, technological and practical achievements of the 20th century. Now let's look at it in a bit more detail. So what was this thing called the Dowding system? 
Well, funnily enough, today we're in a much better position to understand what it really was than people in days gone by. And the reason is this. So if you want to understand how it works, imagine yourself walking along with this thing, as we all do every day. Imagine then that you are actually a German bomber and this is radar. Like this, the radar is silently and invisibly tracking you, watching every movement. And it's sending signals back to a place that is processing all the information, working out what you're doing, what your habits are. Or in the case of Fight Command, it would have gone back to headquarters in Stanmore that's working out what direction you're flying in and at what height. And we could think of that as Google. What does Google do? Well, it doesn't make any decisions about what to do with you. What it does is to get hold of Google Ads. Google Ads then decides what kind of advertisement you might be vulnerable to. And so Headquarters Fighter Command sends the information it's got about what raids are where down to here. This is a group headquarters, actually the headquarters of 11 group at Uxbridge, which controlled about half of Fighter Command's strength. The group then decides what to do, but it doesn't actually do it. It passes that information on down to the sector. And the sector is the part of the organization that actually controls the aircraft. They usually had two squadrons on their end station and had a satellite with another one, and they would order people to scramble, to ring the bell and run like hell, and the interception would take place. And so they are the equivalent of an advertiser. And when you get a ping on your phone telling you that it's 25% off today, you've been intercepted. If you were a German bomber, you wouldn't be going round to get the latest deal from Starbucks. You'd be saying, Achtung, Spitfeuer. So that's the principle of how it worked. Information processing and distribution. So we have the three roles information processing at headquarters, then distribution down to group, group taking the decisions, and then the sectors actually taking action on which those decisions were based. But you've got a huge amount of data here that's being updated every two minutes. Speed of air warfare is unprecedented. The quantity of information is unprecedented. So you've got to be able to display it in a way that people can understand. Let's take a look at how that was done because it's one of the most brilliant pieces of visualization and design of the 20th century. So what do you start off with? Well, you start off with a vision of the battle space. And here it is. This is a map of Southeast England because we're here in 11 group headquarters. These little blocks here that will be moved around by WAFs who will behave very much like croupiers uh, contained information, first of all, about the raider coming in. So they'd have got this from Headquarters Fighter Command. This is hostile raid number one. And there's an estimate of the strength, 40 plus aircraft, i.e. at least 40. Better to err on the side of the lower. And then <clears throat> you've got your own fighters. These are the ones that are being scrambled to intercept. This shows the unit concerned. This is 92 squadron. This shows their strength. 10 aircraft in this case, and their height, 25,000 feet. So we've got three dimensions going on here, but you'll notice that it's also being updated to represent time. Because as the raids come in, little arrows are laid down, and they're in different colors. Some are blue, some are yellow, and others are red. What does that mean? Now, look at that clock over there. That is divided up into segments, each of five minutes. Some are blue, some are red, some are yellow. So those blue arrows were put down at a blue section of the clock. And as they move on, it would then have gone to red, and then it would go to yellow, so that you could tell how old the information was. Constant updating. So you've not only got the three dimensions of space, you've got the fourth dimension of time as well. All visual in front of you, easy to understand. 
Now, it's at group here, at, headqu uh, at headquarters 11 group, that you're actually going to make decisions. So you know who's coming in, you know roughly where they are, you've got to decide what to do about it. So you need to understand what's happening to your own forces. And up in front of you here, because you'd be sitting up there behind glass uh, with other commanders ready to communicate with them by telephone, you've got the state of your own forces. And the actual state that they are in is lit up, attracting your attention. So up here, in front of you, you've got something that was called the tote board, because it is, in fact, based on a tote board from horse racing. A number of the controllers were quite keen horse fans. And you've got each of your uh, sector stations here, rang ranging from Tangmere, which was over down the southwest, right the way through to North Alt in central London. If we look at Biggin Hill there, that was on the road to London, you've got the squadrons at a base there at the moment. So 92, 72 and 66. And you can see what state they're in. And these range from released, which essentially means the pilots are at rest, to being available in 30 minutes, and then at readiness, and then ordered to stand by, which means they're just about ready to be scrambled, and then ordered off and left the ground. The pilots then will be communicating with their own sector stations, so with Biggin Hill, not with Uxbridge, but Biggin Hill would update Uxbridge until they come to detail to raid. In other words, they might start off being told to patrol Maidstone at Angels 25, and then be told there are bandits coming in somewhere to the south of you, and then enemy sighted. That is when the leader of the squadron would say, tally-ho, tally-ho, chaps, which meant they were actually diving down to make the interception. Then, order to land, landed and refueling. Refueling would take place in as little as 30 minutes. Each aircraft had, could spend about an hour in action, and so there's a constant wave of aircraft taking off, intercepting raids, coming back, refueling and rearming, and ready to go. And the great thing about this system was its resilience. It could carry on and on and on. And decision was reached during the Battle of Britain, really as a result of the raids on September the 15th, not because it was a decisive battle, not because it was Fighter Command's most successful day, though it was a very good one, their most successful day when they got three times the number of aircraft that they lost was actually on the opening day of the battle on the 13th of August. Here they got two to one. But what really mattered about September the 15th is that that was the day when the German commanders realised that they were actually getting nowhere. They'd been bashing their heads against a brick wall, a brick wall that could respond to anything they wanted to do for as long as they wanted to keep trying it and nobody in their right mind is going to carry on bashing their heads against the brick wall forever. And so two days later, on September the 17th, an order was issued from the Führer Hauptquartier, actually postponing Operation Sea Lion, the plans to invade this country, until further notice. They were never actually cancelled until March 1944, when preparations being made on this side to move in the other direction were already advanced enough that I think it was fair enough to say Sea Lion was not on anymore. So the architect of the system was Ashmore, the key builder of the system was Dowding, but the person who actually operated the system was Keith Park. He was AOC 11 Group, in charge of what went on here in Uxbridge, with about half of all fighter command strength. And it's been said of him, by Air, Mar Air Marshal Tedder, who ought to know about these things, that if ever one man won the Battle of Britain, then he was it. He hardly put a foot wrong. And looking back over decisions that he took within minutes and having the opportunity to study them in all the detail, knowing everything that he did not know at the time, it is in fact hard to improve on the way in which he ran it. So he was the critical decision maker here. However, he wasn't the only person to make it work. There wasn't in fact one 
man who won the Battle of Britain. There were lots of men, but there were also, by 1940, 17,000 women. I have one of them here next to me. Doris, apparently. Hello, Doris. Why are you here? Well, she's here because the inventor of radar, Robert Watson Watt, wanted her to be here. When he was deciding who should actually man radar stations, he decided they should not be manned, but woman. He wanted women because he said they had better fine motor coordination, more attention to detail, but above all, they were more conscientious than men. And so it was that in 1939, the Air Force formed the Women's Auxiliary Air Force and started recruiting. And by 1940, there were 17,000 of them in all sorts of jobs, including here in the operations rooms. Here she is moving around the blocks, but they did all sorts of other jobs as well. The majority of women uh, were at Stanmore doing the plotting. They were also used um, on the sector stations to communicate with pilots. Uh, one of the reasons that they wanted women there was because their voices are higher and they're easier to understand than men's voices. You've got to imagine that when you're communicating, you're using high-frequency radio. It's not even very high-frequency radio, VHF, which we're used to. That was only started to be introduced in the summer of 1940. And when you're talking over that, it sounds as if there's someone trying to make a cappuccino in the background. So they wanted ladies, uh, or girls more properly, uh, ones who had the right breeding and who had been educated properly, educated in elocution, um, so that they have been having been taught how to say, how do you do? And would you like to come to tea? When they actually talked to the pilots, and said, come in blue two. He knew it was blue two and not red three. Uh, they run out of these girls fairly quickly though. And uh, one veteran of the WAF once told me that uh, by the time that she joined up, they had all sorts. They had ranging from vicar's daughters to prostitutes. Um, VD was a big issue, actually. You had to be declared FFI, free from infection. Now, you've got to remember that in Britain in the 1930s, the genders were segregated just before puberty and effectively never met again until they got married and then in social occasions. They lived in different worlds. And now the proposal was that they were actually going to work together in the same room. And this caused all sorts of problems for people. Uh, the idea was um, widespread that the presence of young ladies like Doris would distract the men from their work and therefore there was a huge controversy over to whether to have mixed watches or not. In other words, whether there are men and women working together at the same time. Uh, there was a big concern over the WAFs who were talking to the pilots over the bad language that they would hear. Um, there was a huge concern about their dress. It was actually an offence for a WAF to wear, believe it or not, non-regulation underwear or silk stockings. Um, there was a lot of concern about keeping them apart. There was disciplinary action threatened if any romances started, all in the interests of decorum. Most of these concerns, of course, turned out to be nonsense. And in January 1940, Keith Park cut in to say that mixed watches were no problem at all, that women did not panic under fire and continue to work in the same way that men did. However, there were some amusing controversies that continued throughout the war. Um, the RAF were extremely advanced in all of this. In September 1940, they actually set up a standing committee uh, under Air Commodore Courtney, which was, had the sole job of finding jobs for women. And they met every month until the end of the war, and each time they found new work for women to do to relieve men who were supposed to go into the front line and start fighting. And so they ended up not just doing this sort of work, not just office work, but being mechanics and fitters and driving tractors on airfields. 
Um, a proposal was put forward in 1939 that the WAF uniform should also contain the option of having slacks. The reason being that it's easier to get into slacks than to put on a, a skirt and therefore they could get down to the sh air raid shelters faster and it would also protect them from the damp. They were getting cold and of course uh, disease um, and illness was a problem. This caused a huge rumpus. Um, there are letters from senior WAF officers who seem to be the ones who are most affronted by this idea saying that it would expose their girls to ridicule and this carried on until somebody just placed an order for thousands of slacks and the girls were able to wear them and didn't seem to be the object of ridicule at all. And it's very interesting how in a lot of these cases things that are mere matters of opinion are laid down as seemingly completely obvious. No one could dispute that the sight of girls wandering around in tunics and slacks would make them look ridiculous, but of course it didn't. It had no grounds whatsoever. And so women were integrated into the service and by the middle of the war there were several hundred thousand of them and it started the process of questioning of our attitudes to gender and what is masculine, what is feminine, what men can do, what women can do, that has carried on ever since. Um, there still were a few problems to be overcome though. Uh, one of them occurred in Kenley. Kenley was uh, subjected to a low level raid on August the 18th which actually took out the ops room by bringing down the power and so they evacuated the ops room to a second line which was a butcher's shop down in the village of Caterham. Uh, this had been chosen because it was just above a, a network of cables laid by the GPO, then responsible for uh, telecommunications, and it was therefore an ideal place for an operations room to take place. These days, they wouldn't have put it in Caterham, they could have sent it to India. It really didn't matter where it was, as long as they could communicate. There was a problem with this building, though. Uh, it was a former butcher's shop, and it only had one toilet and it was up a narrow winding staircase. And so, of course, one toilet for all these people, it was under constant use. And this created a problem when RAF etiquette and social etiquette clashed. Because if you had a senior RAF officer standing in line with a junior WAF, social etiquette said she must go first. But RAF etiquette said he should go first as the senior officer. And the Luftwaffe never realised how close they had come to actually paralysing one of our sector stations. Except that British wit and cunning overcame the problem. And the answer to the problem was that the junior WAF would invite the senior officer to go first. Now he was not only an officer but a gentleman. He would therefore refuse and invite her to go first. And because he was a senior officer, she could interpret this invitation as an order, and therefore she went first, he followed, and the problem was solved. You may think I'm making this up. I heard it from the people who were there. Believe it or not. So it was this system that created the shaft of the spear that made the tip formed by the fighter pilots in their Spitfires and Hurricanes so deadly. The Battle of Britain may have been fought by the few, but it was won by the many.